Well, good morning. So excited to be with you here today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I'm looking forward to this new series that we're going to be sharing through this Advent season. Our 242 series, which comes out of Acts chapter 2, verse 42. We're going to, we're going to put that on hold as we look to and we come expectant of the gift that God has given us in the, the newborn king. We're going to be looking at a series titled, The Earth, Let the Earth Receive Her King. An Advent series that has been written by Dr. Scott Daniels. I'm looking forward to, to sharing this with you here. Our conversation today is going to be hope. And that would be my, my hope, my desire, that, that you would be able to sense God's presence here with you. Wherever you are, whether you're watching online or you're intending to come and be a part of the, uh, the on-campus celebrations. It would be my desire that you would just sense God's presence these are definitely days of uncertainty. These are unprecedented times, and we've heard that expression um, so much uh, throughout the last number of months. But it's my desire that God, can, His presence can be amongst you, that you could sense it, that you could sense that He is with you, that, that, uh, that He is there with you step by step, stride for stride as you do this thing called life, this journey called life. We're going to be looking at, uh, at Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. We're going to be talking about hope and what that means. Um, a hope that can only be found, the, the true hope that only can be found in Christ. If you're with us for the first time and you just found us uh, here online, we'd like to say welcome. And if you don't have a regular place of worship, we would like to invite you to come and just be a part of the, the Gateway family. I would just encourage you to grab that cup of coffee, um, find your place there on the couch, maybe there at the table. Uh, maybe some of you are listening via podcast. Wherever you may be listening or watching this message, I'd just like to invite you to come for the next few moments as, as we unpack uh, this text and as we, we have conversation about hope and what that means, hope, hope in Christ. If you have your Bibles, your tablets, your phones, um, would you please find your way to, to the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 64, and let's read along together. I'm going to be looking um, uh, and reading out of the New International Version, the NIV. Um, so let's read the word together, and let's see what the Lord has for us here uh, today. Uh, Isaiah, chapter 64, uh, beginning um, with verse 1. It says this, all oh, that that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. And when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when, for when you did awesome things that, that we did not expect, you, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for you. Verse 5, you come to, to help those who, who, who gladly do right, you, who remember your ways, O God. But when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How then, how then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean. All, and all of our, our righteous acts are, are like filthy rags. We're all shriveled up like a leaf and, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Verse 7, no one calls on your name or strives to, to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Verse 8, but yet, but yet you, Lord, are our Father we are the clay, and you are the potter. We, we are all the work of your hand. Do not, do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us. Oh, look on us, God, we pray, for we are all your people. As we take a look at this text, I think it's important for us to to understand a couple of things as we, just a little bit of some historical background. See, after decades of, of exile in Babylon, the Judeans are, now they're free to, to return home to their homeland. 
only to find that, that it is completely barren and destroyed. What they thought would be this, uh, this amazing celebration and this incredible homecoming has left them feeling with feelings of, of discouragement and despair, uh, ravaged discouragement and much despair. Imagine, imagine after, after being in, in exile for so many years that, th that this word comes that, that you can now go home. There had to have been, and, and there would be, right? This, this much, this great excitement that would run throughout the people. We're going home. We're going home. I could just imagine as the older generations shared stories to the younger generations, only to return to a, to a place that was unrecognizable. This isn't how we remembered it. What has happened? There's, there's just so much despair. And we see in our text that, that they cry out to God. In that moment, they, they, they sense this incredible distance from God. They're crying out, God, God, where, where are you? What, what has happened? They begin to, to question whether God is, is working on their behalf. If, if, if God is even listening to them at all. Look, look at verse 7 in our text there. It says that no one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and, and, and you have given us over to our sins. The text shares with us, it shows us that, that in the midst of this great sorrow, in the midst of, of this despair, they, 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 they raise up this great lament before God. Look at verse 1 there in our text. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. Oh, God, that you would rend the heavens and, and come down, that, that the mountains would, would tremble before you. The imagery here gives a great sense of, of, of longing, this longing for God to be, re, be revealed, to, for God to, to intervene, for God to interject some light into the midst of, of what seems to be very, very dark, to bring about some kind of hope, Hope that it's in this seemingly hopeless situation. They want God to reveal himself. They, they, they want God to intervene. The one who acts on, on behalf of those that, that are in wait for him. God, they cry out, God, please look upon us. God, please, through our prayers, hear your people. God, we, we need a sense of hope in, in this hopeless situation. Look at verse 4. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for you. Because of this hopeless situation, the people, the, the Judeans, they, they cry out and lament before God. Look at verse 9. Don't be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins. Please don't remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us. Please, God, look down upon us, we pray. Look on us and, and see us and recognize us, for we are your people. They wonder where God is. They, they think that, that they've been abandoned. They, they want to know why, why God would, would leave them this way. God, we've been in exile for so long, and, and God, we've been welcome. We've been told that we could go home, and, and now we get home, and we look around, and this isn't the way that we remember it. Things are so desolate. It's, it's unrecognizable. God, our hearts are breaking. God, we've told our, our, our children, and our children have told their children of the, of the great things that we've experienced in the past. God, that is our desire, but right now we stand in a, in a barren place. God, there's devastation. Lord, there's so much despair. Lord, where are you? Lord, we're, we're crying out to you. They ask God to draw near. Look at, look at verse 2. Come down, God. Come down and make yourself known. The language here. The, the language, come down and, and make yourself known, make known, point to the reality that they long for a, a great and visible, um, a, a great and visible, if you will, intercession from God. 
In other words, burst forth. Lord, come and, and execute vengeance. Lord, God, please come down and, and descend like the psalmist describes in Psalm 18, verse 9. He parted the heavens and he came down. Dark clouds were, were under his feet. See, the, the people of exile, they, they heard stories. They've heard stories from generation to generation in which, which God had interceded in their past. And, and they're wondering, where is God now? God, you've done so much for us. You've done so much for us in the past. God, we're crying out, God, please come now and intervene. These people have heard entire their entire lives. They, they've heard miraculous stories of, of how God established their nation through Abraham and, and how he freed the people from slavery in Egypt through the leadership of Moses. The plagues of Egypt, the, the pillar of fire uh, at night, uh, the, the cloud uh, by day. The, the, the splitting of the, the Red Sea, uh, the defeat of the Amalekites, uh, <laughs> the, the in and out uh, in, in, in the desert, if you will. I, I think that that may be what they called manna back then. They called manna uh, maybe a double-double. I, I mean, after 40 years, you've got to get creative, right? Um, I think that maybe you could even get um, the fries animal style, if you will. They, they recalled how the bitter water at Mara uh, became sweet. There were so many stories. There were, there were so many times where, where God intervened in, on their behalf. And now they're saying, God, here we are. We've come home. And, and, and everything is barren. Everything has been devastated. God, please, can we please have what we had before? God, would you please find favor? Don't miss this. Friends, don't miss this, but the lament of the people leads them to a time of confession. Look at verses 6 through 7. All of us become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous acts are, are like filthy rags. We, have, we all shrivel up like a, like a leaf, and like the wind, our, our sins are, are swept away. Verse 7, no one calls on your name or, or strives to, to lay hold on you. Uh, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. As they petition God to draw close and, and, and reveal his power, the, the lament shifts to confession. They have continued to sin and no one calls on the Lord's name anymore. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6 in the Old Testament says, If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord God Almighty? Luke chapter 6, verse 46 in the message translation says, Why are you so polite with me? Always saying, yes, sir, and, and that, that's right, sir, but, but never doing what I tell you. These words I speak to you are, are not mere additions to your life. Homeowner improvements to, to your standard of living. No, they are foundational words. They are foundation words to build a life upon. There is some true honesty happening in this lament. The people in the midst of this, this time of discouragement and, and devastation, they're, they're coming to, to realize that, that their sin, their, their choices that they have made have, have separated them out and away from God. And now they're crying to God for God to come and rescue, for, for God to come and help. And they're realizing that, that they have caused the, the separation. They, they are being honest with themselves and they are lamenting. They are, they are now confessing to the things, the choices that they have made. They believe that their sins have caused God to, to turn away from them. They, they view their, their righteous acts as, as filthy rags in light of their sin. They are unclean and, and have, uh, have forsaken God. Look at verse 6 there. All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Please note this is a, a communal uh, confession uh, it, it's not about individual sin. Many of these individuals weren't even born yet when the nation of Israel entered exile, which means that this confession is, is not about individual acts, but about who they are and have been historically as a community, a community of people, a community that is supposed to be 
following and being adherent and obedient to God's will upon each of their lives and as a nation. In our, in our current series, 242, um, we have continually looked at, at how the, the, the people, the early church, how they were people that were devoted and committed to, to God's word, being obedient to the commands, the instructions of, of God's word, how they were devoted to, to doing life together and devoted to being a people of prayer. And look at verse 7 again in our text. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. In this instance, the, the, the people, they, they are not devoted. They have not been devoted to and being obedient to what God has instructed them to be. To doing life together, they, they, they began to do things that they wanted to do and, and choices that were made that, that were impacting their children and impacting fellow brothers and sisters. They were to be fully devoted to God and fully devoted to one another in the name of God and in the instruction of God. And then when it came to a time of seeking God's face, being a people of prayer, as we studied in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, um, they negated that. They, they, weren't, they weren't obedient to that. That wasn't something that, that, that was, was impressed upon their hearts to continually do. They got away from that. Friends, when we get away from, from that which God has, has both called us and created us to be, uh, we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. The text shows us that, that this is about corporate sin. The ways that, that, that they as a society, as a people, have forsaken God. The ways that they have been disobedient to whom God has called them to be. And God has called them to be a, a hospitable people who love God and they love their neighbors. They have repeatedly lived in, in opposition to the people that they are called to be. We see this over and, and over again throughout the Old Testament scriptures. It, this is a communal issue. This is a, a corporate issue. Look at, at, at verse 5. It says, we continued to sin. And look at verse 6, all of us, all of us, we continue to sin. And then look at verse 7, not just one, but all of us, we, we continue to sin. This act of confession, it shows a, a shift in their thinking. God is not to blame for their present circumstances, and they're starting to own that which they have done themselves. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, in the message translation, it says this, if we claim that, that we're free of sin, we're only fooling ourselves. A claim like that is errant nonsense. On the other hand, if, if we admit our sins, make a, a clean breast of them, we, he won't let us down. He'll be true to himself. He'll forgive our sins and purchase of, of all wrongdoing. If we claim that, that we've never sinned, we out and out contradict God and make a liar out of him. A claim like that only shows off our ignorance of God, who he is and what he desires to be in our lives. They have known and they, they have known their own choices and actions. And they, they know that, they, that it has gotten them into their current situation. Please catch this. Look at verse 8 there in our text. Isaiah 64 verse 8. Yet you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay. You, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. And then look at verse 9. Don't be angry beyond measure. Do not remember our sin. Please, God, don't remember our sin forever. Oh, look on us, we pray. Look on us, for we are your people. Even in their, their desperation. Listen to this. Catch this. You may want to write this down, but even in the midst of their desperation, they trust that God is listening to them. Psalm 34, verse 6 in the message translation says, When I was desperate, when I was desperate, I called out and God got me out of a tight spot. God's angels set up a circle of, of protection around us while we prayed. Open your mouth and taste. Open your eyes and see how good God is. Blessed are you who run to him. Worship God if you want the best. Worship opens up. Worship opens doors to all of God's goodness. Friends, confession and lament 
often go hand in hand. I'm going to say that again, but confession and lament often go hand in hand. Lament is the act of crying out about our circumstances. Confession is, is both a, a plea for forgiveness and for relationship, a restoration of relationship. In both lament and confession, we can see that there's a, a longing for restoration and renewal. That's an intentional desire for restoration and renewal. See, the, the, the people in our text, that they, 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 reach, they reach a point where there's nothing left to say. Scholarship tells us that, that there's this gap between verse 7 and verse 8. It seems that, that, that between those two verses, that they have expressed so much despair that, that they have nothing left to say. All that's left is, is complete and utter hopelessness. But look at verse 8. Look at verse 8, and I, and I pray that, that, that you catch this here. But verse 8 tells us, Yet you, Lord, yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. In other words, there's this, there's this glimmer of, of hope that eventually comes onto the scene. And, and, and maybe this is what you need to hear today. If you don't hear anything else, you need to hear that, that in the midst of, of, of all of the, the, the trouble, the, 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 the things that maybe you have caused, the, the sin that is in your life, you're crying out to God, God, where are you? You need to know that God is right there, that God is, is listening. And maybe you've cried out, you, 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 you've just, you, you just plead with God, you've pled with God, excuse me, and, and, and you just don't even have any words left. Verse 8 tells us, verse 8 tells us that, that we are the clay, that, that he is the potter, that we are the work of his hand. That, that Psalms 139 says that, that we are God's masterpiece. With his own two hands, he has shaped us and formed us to be who we are. You are the person that, that God has created you to be. But he also tells us that, that, that we can make choices on our own. That, that, that those choices may at times cause us to, to separate ourselves out and away from God. But, but friends, though we make choices and separate ourselves out and away, God hasn't gone anywhere. God, the beloved Heavenly Father, He is still there and He is waiting for us. He, he's drawing it. He wants to draw us back in. He wants to hold us close and call us His beloved. There's this glimmer of hope that comes out of verse 8. After the gap between 7 and 8, verses 7 and 8, however, the, the entire tone of, of the text, it changes. It's, it's like if somebody switched a, a, a light, they flipped a switch. Because between verses 7 and 8, now we see that, that God is now Father. And that, that God is being referred to as, as the, the potter. The people are now the clay and, and we are the work of His hand. Their circumstances haven't changed from verse 7 to 8. They are still looking at a desolate place to call home. They are still faced with insurmountable odds. But what shifts, however, is their point of view. Don't miss out, but, but what shifts is their point of view. There's this intentional seeking of God in the midst of, of this hopeless situation. There is hope. I'm going to say that again. There, there, there is hope. Not because of the, uh, the good that the people have done. Their confession shows that they have lacked good and, and right actions. They, they've lacked that. But there's hope. There, there's hope not because of their, their circumstances. Their homeland is still, it still lies in ruins. Yet there is hope. Why? Because of who God is. There's hope for each and every one of us. Why? Because of who God is. Friends, when, when we acknowledge that God's ways are the best for us and we're obedient to those ways, we'll see the fulfillment of our faith. We'll see that when we see Him, when we seek Him. Isaiah chapter 49 verse 23 says, Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Those who hope in God will not, will not be disappointed. Friends, look at verses 8 through 9. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look upon us, we pray. Because God, because God, we are your people. 
Lord, in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our shame, in the midst of our choices, in the midst of what, what seems like just very difficult times. And, and Lord, maybe in, in our own lives, we feel like things are in shambles. Look upon us, God. Look upon us, we pray, because we are your people. The text tells us that they're acknowledging that God is their father. This is about relationship. They, they express their confidence in God who, who loves them in spite of their failings. God is the, is the potter. God is at work molding them, actively moving in ways that make God's people look more like God. They are God's people. After the lament and, and the confession, the people remember their identity. Regardless of whether they have a home, they remain the people of God. Please hear me, friends, but there is hope for us, too, even in the midst of our hopeless situations. On this first Sunday of Advent, many of us are also walking through or towards seemingly hopeless situations. Maybe we are looking ahead at, at spending time with family with a, with a deep apprehension that our longing for a picture-perfect holiday could, could easily be tattered by, by addiction, unhealthy relationships, or, or unspoken pain. Some of us walk towards the, the holiday season knowing that, that we won't have a loved one with us, that there will be an empty chair at the table. What is supposed to be a joyous occasion has become one of distress and, and heartache. Others of us were, were looking forward to, it, to a great year, only to be faced with financial hardships or, or illness. And, and we wonder, how, how will we make it? In our own lives, God feels distant in the midst of hopeless situations. Dr. Scott Daniels says, and I quote, despair has a way of robbing us of joy. We wonder where God is in the midst of this pain. We look longingly at, at where God has worked in the past and, and, and ask whether God is still close to us now. He adds, confession is an, an important part of Advent. Not all of our hopeless situations are, are caused by our own choices or our own sins. Sometimes they are caused by the sins and, and choices of others. Yet we know there are places that we ourselves need to confess. Sometimes we have participated in collective action that, that has wronged others. Other times we might need to confess our attitudes or our thoughts in response to others. We don't always think of Advent as a time of confession. But confession often leads, it often leads us to look at things with new eyes, to have a new approach, to have a new sense of, of hope. Through our lament and our confession, in the midst of our desperation, we are led to remember who God is and, and also who we are. Our circumstances, our circumstances this Advent might not change. All of those hopeless situations that, that we are facing might still be facing us even as Christmas comes. But we must remember, dear friends that are gathered here today in this conversation, friends, we must remember that God is still our Father, that He is still the potter. We must remember, we must remind each other, we must encourage each other that, that God desires relationship with us. In spite of what we've done and despite of our circumstances, God still desires relationship with us. God also desires to, to make us a holy people in spite of what we've done and despite our circumstances. We are still God's people. We're not forsaken by God. And as God's beloved people, we have hope. I'm going to say that again. And as God's beloved people, we have hope that God is still doing a new thing in us. Does anybody want to say amen? If you're sitting there in the room with somebody, look across and just say amen. That was good stuff. That, that we as God's people, we have hope that God is still doing a new thing in us. I love 
I love what Zechariah says in the Old Testament in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 12. He says this of God, return to the stronghold, return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I, that being God, will restore, will restore, will bring restoration. As we draw a close to our conversation here today, this topic of hope, as we begin this Advent season, what, a, what an amazing image. What an amazing image that God's people, God's people captured by hope in ways that they can and not escape. That, that we are prisoners of, of hope in God, that he who, who leads them out into exile, he who, who leads them out into exile will be faithful to finish that which he has started. Oh, he who has created a, a work in you will be faithful to complete it. We just have to trust God. We have to allow God to move in our hearts and in our lives. So even today, so even today, weeks, weeks before Christmas, when we will celebrate the, the, the light of, of, of the world coming, when, when the earth will rejoice over the birth of Christ, in the midst of our despair today, we still cling to hope because we are still the beloved children of God. So it is with that, it is with that here this morning that we, were, we, light, we light the Advent candle, the Advent candle of hope. That as we look to this candle, we will be reminded of the hope the light that has entered into our world, the light that has exposed the darkness, the darkness of, of the evil, and expresses the light, the hope that we can have in Christ. We light this Advent candle. We light it proclaiming that our hope is in the Lord. We light it so that we can give thanks to God always because of the grace that has been given to us in Christ Jesus. It is through him that, that we have become rich in hope. Amen. All of our hope is in the Lord. Let earth receive her king. This is the word of God for the people of God. And I say, thanks be to God. Shalom. Let's take a moment now and let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather, Lord, whether it be on the, the internet, Lord, uh, through social media means, whether we're here on campus, we pray, Father God, that you would just draw close to us right now. And Lord, for those of us, if our, if our heart, if our spirit is, is discouraged, Father God, if we just feel like things are just... Uh, uh, Lord, there's uncertainty or things are in shambles. Lord, we would just ask that you would come right now that we would sense your presence. And Lord, like this candle represents, Lord, may, may it expose, Lord, anything that, that is separating us and keeping us away, the, the sin that would be in our lives, Lord. May we, Lord, come. May we, in our time of lament, Lord, may we confess to you, Lord, that our choices have kept us separated away from and lord may we come today seeking lord reconciliation redemption lord and let us experience your grace your peace your hope your love your joy father god we love you and we praise you we thank you for this day lord this gift that you have given us this day may we live it lord for you wholeheartedly in your precious and gracious name amen and amen Good morning, Gateway family and friends. Thanks for joining in with us in your home as we begin the Advent season in singing, in worship, in the word, and in prayer. I trust that you already sense the presence of the Lord as we've come to worship this morning. We welcome each one of you. Thanks, Pastor Joe, for the message on hope taken from the Old Testament book of Zechariah. What more do we need to hear today from the Lord than the words of hope in times like these? 
It seems like many are battling what seems like hopelessness. If you have come this morning weary and exhausted, I can tell you that comfort and renewed strength is promised to everyone who seeks the Lord. He knows your name and he knows your need, that nothing is too hard for the Savior as you abide in him and his word. He can solve every problem. The Advent season is a time of increasing spiritual anticipation leading up to the Lord's first coming to redeem mankind. The Messiah of old has come to be our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He has come to fulfill his purposes in our lives. If you want hope in this dark world, all you have to do is open your heart, invite Jesus to come in, and he will bring hope to your life. Bow with me now as we look to the only one who can give us hope. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your holy presence this morning, like the shepherds of old, we bring the sacrifice of praise. You are awesome and worthy of all that we could ever lay at your feet. Thank you for your redemptive plan of salvation. May we be a people who embrace your hope and share it with many yet lost in exile. We pray for our gateway family and friends. Strengthen and comfort all who are in need of emotional, physical, spiritual renewal. Thank you for every blessing and answer to prayer we've already received. And we pray today for our government leaders in these uncertain times. Bring unity, peace, and healing to our troubled nation. Grant wisdom and courage to our leaders to honor the biblical core values of our faith. Forgive us of our sin and bring revival to our land, I pray. Help us to rest in the knowledge that you are Lord of all and we can trust in your sovereign rule over all. Remind us that all of our tomorrows are known and in your hands. Why worry when we can pray in victory? In closing, may the words of the Apostle Paul be our prayer. May the God of hope fill you with great joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus, our Emmanuel, God with us. Let the church say, Amen. Amen.